Thank you very much. So due to practical reasons, we have a little delay and my talk will be uh, a bit shorter because I want to uh, definitely stop in time for Richard's talk, which is still scheduled for three to four. And uh, so let's directly dive into what we did yesterday. <coughs> So again, a very short summary. We first introduced this motivic generating series in the motivic quantum space. This was this ring with a slightly twisted multiplication. Um, motivic generating series for quiver Q. And then we uh, saw two different kinds of factorizations. Factorization one was if you, uh, well, okay, we also computed examples. If you take a logarithmic Q derivative, or more precisely, a logarithmic L derivative of a Q, then you get a generating function for actual moduli spaces, namely the Hilbert schemes uh, of representations of the quiver. Log L derivative of a Q gives generating series of, I will not make this precise again because we'll take more, uh, look closer at the uh, second factorization. We got a, a generating series of virtual motives of Hilbert schemes. And actually in the question and answer session, uh, yesterday afternoon, I almost gave the complete proof for this. So then we saw the factorization two. <coughs> And uh, so today I will mainly discuss factorization three. Factorization two was the wall crossing formula. And I will repeat the definition. Wall crossing formula. AQ admits a factorization as an ordered product over the reals in descending order of local series AQX SST. That's the wall crossing formula. <clears throat> and uh, this local motivic generating series, that's defined as the global motivic generating series, but just looking at semi-stable representations of a fixed slope. So let me repeat this. AQX SST is defined as one plus sum over all dimension vectors of slope X. <clears throat> and then we take the um, semi-stable locus inside the representation variety and we still act with the structure group we take the quotient of virtual motives and t to the d so but this only involves dimension vectors of a fixed slope <coughs> that's important and uh, <coughs> so that means in the space of all dimension vectors which is a uh, space of dimension cardinality of Q0, the number of vertices, you have a co-dimensional, a co-dimension one subspace because that the, the slope of D is a fixed real X. That's just one linear condition. So I have a co-dimension one subspace. All right. So, and everything here depends on the choice of a stability function or a slope function. Uh, we had a slope function mu of d defined as theta of d by kappa of d, where theta and kappa are um, just linear functions, real valued linear functions on the space of all dimension vectors. And there's one question of what the space of stability structures uh, defined in this term, uh, in these terms looks like. Um, this is something I cannot really discuss in a, ni a nice way today but I will keep it in mind for tomorrow. But I'm afraid since I want to concentrate on factorization property three and DT invariance today, I cannot discuss this, this whole stability space. Okay, so that, that, was the, that was the second result. And I also uh, almost gave you all the details of the proof, namely this is formally equivalent to the existence of this unique filtration this harder narrow sum infiltration of, of representations. Okay, so that was a summary of yesterday. And now to somehow 
motivate the dt invariance, let me make one remark. Um, in this factorization one, the surprising thing was that we were doing something very formal with the motivic generating function, namely we were just taking a formal logarithmic derivative. And out of this very procedure, we got something very concrete and geometric, namely the motives of Hilbert schemes. And the same happens here, namely, if you look at these local series, they also contain geometric information. So, fact is, and this is somehow the, then the motivation for defining dt invariance, which we'll do in the next 10 minutes. The fact is that if you have a dimension vector which is co-prime, if d is co-prime for this slope function, I will tell you what it is, u co-prime, that is, for all proper non-zero subdimension vectors, the slope is different. <coughs> The important thing is that the all coordinates are less sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So this means EI less than or equal DI for all I, but uh, they are not equal. Yeah. So component wise, yeah. So for all smaller dimension vectors, the slope is different. And if you work this out, for example, for a two vertex quiver, then this is really like a co prime, like the co primality which you know from the theory of moduli spaces of vector bundles. Yeah? The co-prime case there means rank and degree are co-prime. And this is something similar here. It basically means that more or less, well, for a generic choice of, of mu, this co-primality means that the entries of D are co-prime. So the GCD of all the entries is one. It's not a proper multiple of anything else. If this holds, this co-primality, then the following holds. <coughs> The t to the d coefficient in this series, then the t to the d coefficient in this local series for the slope equals the motive of an actual variety, more or less. So the motive of an actual moduli space. Okay, and now I have to decorate this, this motive a little bit to, to make this uh, exact. So first of all, we're taking the uh, motive of the moduli space of mu stable representations of Q of dimension vector D. We're taking the virtual motive and we have to decorate this by one of these annoying little factors. Uh, one over L to the minus one half minus L to the one half. Okay, where, and now I will explain what this is. Where this is defined as taking the, the semi-stable locus and taking a geometric quotient by the group action. So, geometric quotient. This is now a moduli space, no longer a moduli stack, moduli space. Okay, so that's the precise formulation of this fact, and now let me discuss it a little bit. Marcus? Yes, please. There is a stable locus. Uh, stable or, yes, okay, so let, let me put brackets around here because it doesn't matter. That's, that's the first point which I would like to explain. <coughs> it actually doesn't matter. Okay, so I defined stability and semi-stability. Semi-stability means the slope is weakly decreasing on sub-representations and stability means the slope is strictly decreasing on sub-representations. Now, if we have a dimension vector with this special property, then asking for the slope to decrease or to weakly de decrease is equivalent, yeah? Because there is no proper subrepresentation which can have the same slope. 
Ah, wonderful. This means that stable and semi-stable locus are exactly the same. And now this has a wonderful consequence. Namely, if you look, uh, if you consider geometric invariant theory, it tells you that for the semi-stable locus, you always have a very nice quotient. And for the stable quotient, uh, for, for the stable locus, this quotient is in fact geometric. Yeah? So a geometric quotient here exists. It doesn't matter whether we write semi-stable or stable, it's, it's the same. And a geometric quotient exists. The group action of GD on here is not free. There is always the group of scalars, so scalars diagonally embedded, which acts trivially. Because if you remember the group action on this space of quiver representations, this group action was given by some kind of conjugation. And conjugation is of course trivial if you take scalars. Yeah? So the scalars act trivially, so what you are honestly taking here is a quotient by the projectivized group. But I haven't introduced this, so let me just uh, switch back to GD. But, I mean, this geometric quotient is a PGD principal bundle. And taking this projectivization amounts to factoring a multiplicative group of the field out of, out of this group. And uh, so this ugly little factor here, that's just the virtual motive of the multiplicative group of the field. Yeah? So this explains this factor. We always have, we have an annoying, annoying little factor coming from um, the virtual motive of the multiplicative group of the field because we don't have a free action of the group GD. Okay, but uh, anyway, in this very special situation, if you look at this, the quotient of the motives, or say the motive of the stack, is then more or less the motive of this quotient space. And that's, yeah, so this is some of the, it's the lowest order term in this series. Aha, this is great news and really uh, formally compares to factorization number one. Doing a certain formal manipulation with this generating series, suddenly an honest geometric information pops up the actual motive of a space. Here it was motive of Hilbert schemes, and here we get, as the lowest order terms of these series, we get, more or less, the motives of moduli spaces parametrizing stables. But only under this special coprimality assumption. Which is not too bad. Well, we know this phenomenon from moduli spaces of vector bundles. The good theorems are always about the co-prime case, where rank and degree of the bundle are co-prime. And in general, you get singular moduli spaces, things are much more complicated. But anyway, we are here in the quiver situation, which is supposed to be much simpler than moduli spaces of vector bundles, because, well, at the end of the day, we're just doing linear algebra. So uh, we can be very brave and ask, what is the meaning of the other coefficients in here? Yeah? So the lowest order coefficients give the motive. Yeah. So this is e to the d coefficient, that's the lowest order lowest order coefficients in this local series. So what about the other coefficients? Okay, and now comes the uh, extremely brave um, idea of taking this local series under a certain technical hypothesis and just brute force factoring it into an infinite product. And then the exponents appearing in this brute force factorization should have a meaning. These are the dt invariants. Yeah? Okay. Now we factor Um, now we factor this local series. Yeah? So in the first step, we are taking the factorization of the, of the global series into these sl um, slope local series, and now we want to factor this series. To efficiently do this factorization, we need a bit of notation, because otherwise we will have uh, lots and lots of a very ugly threefold uh, infinite products, and we just want to get rid of them in the, from the notation. And that's why we introduce the so-called plethistic exponential. 
So to simplify, so this is a very, a very small come on, notational intermission before we come back to, to the geometry. To simplify a huge infinite product, we make the following definition of the so-called plethistic exponential. <clears throat> well, from the term exponential, you can already guess it's something. Uh, what, what is an exponential? An exponential is, uh, is a transformation which maps uh, sums to products. Yeah, the exponential is more or less defined by the functional equations. We want to do this for such formal series, formal power series. It should, be, it should convert sums to products. And then the very simple-minded ideal is to convert a monomial to a geometric series. Yeah? So let me give you the axioms for defining the exp, the plethistic exponential. If you apply exp to a monomial, and a monomial for us would be something like L to the i half t to the d, yeah? where d is a dimension vector, and i is an integer. These are our monomials in our localized motivic ring, motivic quantum space. And I define the, expon uh, the plethistic exponential of this as the, genera as the um, geometric series. Okay? And the other thing is it should convert sums into products. X of x plus g should be x of f times x of g, like you expect from an exponential. Huh? So it's really like an exponential, but the initial condition is transform monomials into a geometric series. And now this is a wonderful tool for uh, making huge infinite pro. If f and g can for something. Excuse me. F and G should commute for session. Um, yes, they should commute, actually. So we will only do this uh, in, under a certain technical assumption, which I will um, introduce in the next definition. Yes. So this defines continuous um, group let me be precise, this defines a continuous group homomorphism from <clears throat> um, well, now I have to be really careful. So I um, <clears throat> because I don't know what, what motives I have in this gurdon degree of varieties, I will just take the subring generated by L and properly localized. Yeah, so this is the subring of our motivic ring. And then I adjoin all these uh, T to the D. And I'm considering the maximal ideal in there where uh, the, of all series with constant term zero set of all f in here such that f of zero is zero, so which is just the maximal ideal. And uh, I map it to the set of all f in here where the constant term is one, because all the constant terms of these geometric series are one, yeah? So I take power series with constant term zero and I map, it, map them to uh, power series with constant term one. And it is a group homomorphism where here you take the additive structure and here you take the multiplicative structure, which is expressed in this uh, functional equation. Yeah? And it's continuous because, well, we want to continue this to infinite sums, to all the infinite sums which are, we are allowed to take in this uh, formal power series ring. Uh, can you extend the plethistic exponential to your whole motivic ring? Haha. <laughs> Oh, there is a, there's lots of work on this. Um, yes, yes, basically you can do this. Um, you can get these, um, well, you can get, uh, okay. So the plethistic exponential is defined whenever you have a lambda ring. And so you have to find the right lambda ring structure on uh, this motivic ring. And um, 
So you have to define these atoms operations and they are defined using taking symmetric powers of varieties. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, uh, th there's lots of, of work on, on doing this in, in the generality. And luckily for us, we only have to work with everything which is motivated by the left shift motive. Yeah. So we can do this, this uh, simple thing here. Okay, and I'm not absolutely precise here. So this defines a continuous group homomorphism in case um, that this ring... F of zero is equal to one on the right? F of, not F of one. <laughs> Thank you very much. F of zero is one, yes. <laughs> no, I, I better not plug in one in these series. In case uh, that this ring is commutative. Or actually, we will now um, work in subrings which are commutative. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the general. That is a, a question. You oh yes, to... sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, we, so we take L, but you said there define the X also for L to the I over two. So do we? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. To, to, to everything to everything which is generated by L in here. Yeah, yeah. L and, and all the localizations we already have. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, well, the problem is doing this, doing this formally somehow um, disguises the very simple nature of, of this construction, yeah? So, um, let's better do an example, yeah? Namely, let's, let's come back to to the motivic generating series of the trivial quiver without any arrows, which we computed yesterday as an exercise. And let's use this uh, plethistic exponential terminology to simplify this. So we computed this yesterday as product over i from zero to infinity, one over one minus l to the i plus one half t. Okay? So, now we want to rewrite this as a plethistic exponential of something. And now the rule is really simple. This product converts into a sum. That's what X is good for. And here you see a geometric series, and this transforms into a monomial. And that's it. Yeah? It's precisely these two axioms. You transform form this product into a sum, and you transform the geometric series into a simple monomial. But now you see that you can simplify this infinite sum here inside because it gives you again a geometric series. So this you can rewrite as x of. Okay, so I have the sum over all i, l to the i, and then a constant part. So it's l to one half times t divided by one minus l. And uh, for good reasons, I somehow normalize this and uh, uh, multiply numerator and denominator by L to the minus one half to finally arrive at L to the minus one half minus L to the one half. Aha. And uh, out of a sudden, we see this denominator here, which somehow pop up naturally in the geometry above there. This is just dividing something by the virtual motive of the multiplicative group. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So this is the first indication that this x is something reasonable. And uh, now we have seen that this somehow magically pops up here in factoring the geometric, uh, the motivic generating series for the trivial quiver. And it also appears in these lowest order terms of these, uh, of these local motivic generating series. Now let's unify everything into one central definition. And um, yes. <clears throat> Formal definition. So assume 
So we have a quiver, and we also fix the stability as before, because we want to consider these local series. Mu is stability, x is a fixed slope. And now we make the assumption such that the Euler form, the Euler form of the quiver, when restricted to all dimension vectors of the fixed slope, this is a co-dimension one space of dimension vectors, this should be symmetric. So this is, this is the important technical assumption, yeah? So the Euler form, when restricted to this co-dimension one space of dimension vectors of a fixed slope, should be symmetric. Because this implies that a certain part of the motivic ring, namely the part of the motivic ring where we only consider monomials of the slope, is commutative. Yeah? Because the twist in this motivic ring was defined using the anti-symmetrized Euler form. Let's note this. So that implies the part of the motivic ring um, x, x, which is the span of all t to the d, where d is of slope x, is commutative. That's the reason why we make this assumption, yeah? So a certain local part of this form of power series ring is commutative. Um, and then we define certain rational functions, d, t, d, uh, mu of q. So it depends on the dimension vector of slope x. It depends on the stability and on the quiver. And a priori, this is just a, a, a rational function in the left shots, in the half left shots motive. So a priori, it's only a rational function in the half left shots motive. And this you define by factoring the local series. So you just take this local series and you factor it into a product, means you write it as an exponential of the following form. Well, first a standard term, L to the minus one half minus L to the one half. This now doesn't come as a surprise. And then the sum over all dimension vectors of slope x, dtd mu of, of q, while of this of q I don't like. Um, let me omit it. So, the quiver is not a variable. The variable is still the left hand motive somehow. Okay, just like this, d to the d. Okay. Okay, so now that's the central definition which we will explore for the rest of the talk and let's uh, try to digest this and let's see what is the logic of, of this definition. Okay. So first of all, okay, so we take our motivic generating function. Yeah, question about notation. Uh, it, no, it's about the, uh, the t to the d. I mean, we want, do you also include the, the neutral element? I mean, like, what is what d equal to? Um, no, in the, in the above. In the yeah. I guess so, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I just want efficient notation. <laughs> Take I don't have any idea, so let me just formally allow zero. It somehow worked better with the definition of these local series where I just put this one plus in front, but here it just doesn't work. Okay, so 
our logic is using the hardener Nara Simon filtration, we can factor the, the whole motivic generating series into local contributions from the slopes. The proof of concept is that at least the lowest order terms of this series have a geometric meaning because they encode the motive of actual moduli spaces. Aha, so it's what, it was a good idea to do this factorization. Now we want more. We want to factor this whole thing. And the universal tool for writing down such factorizations into huge products is the plethistic exponential. To have this plethistic exponential well defined, we need some commutativity. And this commutativity, this local commutativity, is contained here in the definition that the restriction to the Euler form uh, to a fixed slope is symmetric. And then we just take the series and factor it into an infinite product. And a priori, the guys appearing there could have all sorts of crazy denominators, so let, let's just say it's irrational functions in the half left shift motive to be on the safe side. And here we always have a standard term, which doesn't come as a surprise because we already have it when we just factor, do the factorization for the trivial, for the trivial quiver. So that's a factor which we cannot avoid, first of all. And it is also reasonable to expect this factor from the geometry, which we have seen uh, here. Yeah? So this hopefully motivates this very brave definition of motivic DT invariance of a quiver. And uh, okay, so now we have something to uh, explore. Can I ask a question about the statistic exponential? Yes, please. I've always been confused about this. Where does one hide the factorials? The factorial? Well, because the exponential, you know, you have over n factorial. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. See, I, I didn't want to talk about uh, lambda rings. <laughs> so I, I always um, prefer this, this ad hoc definition of the plethistic, plethistic exponential by saying, it has the functional equation of an exponential and this initial condition monomial goes to geometric series. Um, when you define this in a general lambda ring, you define it as follows. So you can define the plethistic exponential as the usual exponential composed with uh, psi, which is the generating series of all Adams operations. So psi is the sum over all i, 1 over i, and then psi i in a lambda ring with Adams operations psi i. Yeah? So in a, in a lambda ring you have this, these, these lambda i operations and this gives uh, the whole ring a structure of a module over, over um, symmetric functions. And the lambda i correspond to the elementary symmetric functions, and then you do the base change to the power series to the power sum functions, and these are the Adams operations. So it's all this formal lambda ring stuff. Yeah? And so this is the way you, you can do this in arbitrary lambda rings. And there you have the honest exponential. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, which also easily proves so in this way you can easily prove that you have uh, an inverse, a plethistic logarithm. So log is then just psi inverse composed with the, with the usual log from a power series log, where psi inverse uh, arises from this by um, Möbius inversion. Möbius function of i by i times uh, Adams operation psi i. Thanks for the question, because we will come back to the Möbius inversion uh, anyway in a minute. Okay, <clears throat> so, huh. okay. so uh, at length I try to explain the logic of why we define these DT invariants. And uh, now let's see some examples. And uh, to compute any single example is uh, quite hard. But at least we... Yes, please. How do you know that such a factorization is possible? Yes, you are right. <laughs> okay, I forgot to tell you something. Um, <clears throat> I forgot to tell you that... Uh, yes. <laughs> I forgot to tell you this, that this not only defines a continuous group homomorphism, but actually an isomorphism of groups, because the exp 
has an inverse log. And, uh, and, and this in particular tells you you can factor any series with constant term 1 in this way. Oh, sorry for that. That's, of course, the important point. Um, yeah, so x has an inverse log, so you can just apply log here, and this defines the dt invariance. So what kind of, what if examples do we have? Aha. Uh -huh. So one example is on the blackboard. <coughs> Namely, the trivial quiver. Yeah? Then we have this factorization. And so for the a trivial quiver, we find that the dt1, we don't need any stability. We can just take the trivial stability here. That the dt1 is 1, and all other dt are 0. dtd is 0 for all d strictly greater than 1. And that's the first example. The second example is the one loop quiver. We can also do the one loop quiver because we have seen yesterday how to factor the motivic generating function for the one loop quiver into an infinite product. Now take this infinite product from yesterday, reinterpret it as, as an exp, and then you can read off the dt invariance for this, namely the dt in dimension one is the virtual motive of the affine line and all other dt are zero. Aha. Now, this is not too bad. This already tells us something about or gives us a hint of the dt invariant being of geometric origin. Yeah? Because, well, what is the classification of quiver representations for this quiver? That's the classification of vector spaces. Every vector space is a direct sum of a unique one-dimensional space, which explains the invariant one in dimension one. For the loop quiver, we are looking at matrices up to conjugation, think John canonical form, and we have a discrete, uh, we have a continuous um, classification parameter involved, namely eigenvalues. And this is the A1 encoding eigenvalues. So this is the moduli space for possible, for possible eigenvalue of a matrix. Aha. So um, third example, which is also on the blackboard, is where we have seen these lowest order terms here in the co-prime case. And uh, this is also something we should notate. So third example, Q is now arbitrary. And we need this assumption that D is co-prime. D co-prime for the chosen stability. And then the DT invariant is as we have seen here, the motive of the, the virtual motive of the stable modulite space. MD mu ST of Q virtual mode motive. <coughs> yeah? Because this is precisely the lowest order term in this uh, local gen generating series. And if you then rewrite this as a as an infinite product, then these lowest order terms survive anyway. Yeah, so that's not difficult to see that this is true. Aha, so in all cases, apparently the dt invariant carries some geometric information. And uh, I hope this prepares us all for the final theorem. Yes, final theorem for today. And this final theorem is that the dt invariant, in fact, is always of geometric origin. It's not the motive of, of an actual moduli space, at least not for mathematicians. For physicists, it is. Because physicists believe in a certain 
moduli space of quiver representations with which mathematicians can't define. But um, okay, so theorem is dt is geometric, that's the slogan. More precisely, under all the assumptions, uh, under all the assumptions which we need to define, uh, we have the following dtd mu equals. Okay, so what's the geometry? The geometry is the moduli space of semi-stables. And now for general D, we have to be careful. In the co-prime case, I convinced you that stable and semi-stable is the same anyway, so we don't have to care. But in general, we have to take care. And we are taking the moduli space of semi-stables. That is, in general, so this is typically a very singular moduli space. Yeah, because it's really a GIT quotient, but you have different types of stabilizers, and uh, so in general you only, I mean, it's, it, it, well, you have severe singularities, not just orbifold singularities. These are really severe singularities. Vertices of cones, for example. At least normal singularities, but that's it. So it's a singular space, and uh, well, you can already guess that taking the motive of a singular space, ah, it's not so well behaved like motive of something smooth projective. So what can we do better? Well, there is a cohomology theory which is perfectly well suited for singular varieties, which is intersection cohomology. Yeah? And uh, so the final result is you take compactly supported intersection cohomology with rational coefficients of this, and we take the Poincaré polynomial of all these, and where our polynomial summation parameter is, of course, again, our, our uh, minus square root of left sheds. So we take the Poincaré polynomial of local uh, compactly supported intersection homology. Um, I better take a dimension. Take the sum over all i. And that's almost it except for a little twist factor. Well, you guess what? So again, you have to twist by minus square root of left sheds to Euler form of the of a minus one. So this holds if, if there is at least one stable point. And if there is no stable point, this might happen. You might have um, only st uh, properly semi-stable points. Then the dt invariant refuses to exist, so it's just zero. Okay, so this is the precise result that the dt invariant is geometric. And uh, if it's, uh, it's, it's non-zero non-empty. So if there is a stable point, yeah, then this is the formula. If there's no stable point, then it's, uh, it's zero. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the interpretation of Sven Meinert and myself of, of something which was conjectured or believed in, in physics by uh, Mansrott, Piolin, and Zen, for example. Namely, they say the dt invariant is the actual motive of some moduli space. So physically, we really want to have something like the dt invariant is the virtual motive of some moduli space. And let me call it the physics moduli space. But nobody can define this mathematically. Yeah. But this is generally believed to be true, that the dt invariant is really an actual motive of some space which we just can't define mathematically. And the replacement for this, well, this is just a vague dream. This is not a theorem. And the precise mathematics statement is that it is the Poincaré polynomial in uh, intersection homology. If we can find a small resolution of, yeah. uh, yes. so of course. Once you have a small resolution, you are done because the 
cohomology of a small resolution is the intersection cohomology of variety. And if we are lucky that the whole cohomology is just pure Tate, then it's, uh, the um, Poincaré polynomial is the same as, as the virtual motive. But, um, no. I mean, think about moduli spaces of vector bundles on curves. Only in, the, only in rank two, uh, there are known desingularizations of the singular moduli spaces, yeah? So rank two degree uh, even, then you know a desingularization of the moduli space with only all default uh, singularities. There is this general procedure of Francis Calvin to desingularize singular moduli spaces, but the bookkeeping is terrible and uh, nobody knows what the final outcome would be. So this is unsolved. So I, I'm not sure that a small resolution exists. I was looking for this for years, but not very promising. <laughs> we have a question in the Q&A. Yes. Do you always need to assume that the other form is symmetric? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the assumption which I used to uh, actually define the DT invariance, this continues to hold. Otherwise, DT is not, not even defined. I mean, you, you could define it, but it's just nonsense. It's just not interesting. Yeah. So still under this, under this assumption that you have this local symmetry. Uh, symmetry. Yes. <clears throat> Is it a priori clear that this should live in the ring generated by the left its moment? No, no, that's only a posteriori. So this, this theorem is, by the way, proof of the so-called integrality conjecture for DT invariants. <laughs> that they are really polynomial in the left shed, or in the half left shed's motive. Yeah. Um, we have another question. In the last theorem, is it easy to see an example where the DT invariant is not the class of a quotient stack of the semi-stable locus by G of D? Uh -huh. um. <clears throat> yes, I think so. So, um. ah, yeah, it's a bit more time. I mean, lots of interesting examples already happen. So very interesting class of examples is if you just take a quiver, which is a bunch of loops, say m loops where m is at least two. And uh, then I would say even for dimension three, one can easily compute the dt invariant just from its definition, but um, nobody knows a small desingularization of the moduli space, so I mean, even dimension three pairs of matrices, I would say this is uh, unknown then if, it's, if it is the actual motive of something. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, this is, this is a good example anyway. <clears throat> so now that we know that the DT invariant behaves polynomially in the half left shed's motive, we can specialize L at one. This wasn't clear a priori because a priori it was only uh, a rational function in L. We can specialize it to L equals one, and then what we get is the so-called numerical DT invariant. And uh, at least for loop quivers, there is a closed formula. I think it's almost the only case where you have a closed formula for these DT invariants, numerical DT invariants. And let me show you this formula. So this is the M loop quiver, and the dt invariant, um, we take the specialization of L to 1, and this is then gi uh, given by, now I'm not sure about the convention, so let me say plus or minus, yeah, because I'm always mixing up the signs. Um, it's a Möbius inversion, namely it's 1 over d squared, sum over all divisors of d, Möbius function of d by e, an ugly sign, minus one to the m minus one times d minus e, and then a huge uh, binomial coefficient, m times e minus one over e minus one. So that's a sample formula of how the t invariants look like, and um, this is almost the only case where you have such an explicit formula. There are two or three more. And, uh, well, you see, first of all, that the DT invariants somehow, the numerical DT invariants grow pretty fast, grow exponentially, because, uh, well, if you grow in D, then you have this 
a leading term like a uh, binomial coefficient md over d, which is pretty large. Um, in general, it's very complicated because you have this Möbius inversion, and um, I don't want to give you as an exercise uh, that this sum is a priori divisible by d squared, which I claim here, yeah? So I claim that this is integral. So in particular, this, this Möbius inversion over binomial coefficients should be divisible by d squared. This is terrible. This is, um, I mean... It is an integer. It is, it is actually, it is actually an integer. No, I mean it's, it's well. No, I mean, my proof of that is number theoretic. No, I mean so dt at l equals one always must be an integer. Yes, if you look here at the at this geometric geometricity statement, you just take the uh, Euler characteristic and compactly support intersection cohomology. So it's really just an Euler characteristic of some. Uh, I see intersection homology Euler characteristic of, of a moduli space. Because it should be plus minus one uh, some um, <clears throat> Yes, actually, actually there is a general purity result. So actually uh, only even uh, intersection cohomology spaces are, can be non-zero. Yeah, I haven't claimed this here, but there's some purity going on. Yeah. So this is how they typically look. And then finally, to finish the proof, uh, let me give you three pictures <coughs> relating everything to the huge topic of scattering diagrams. Oh, yes, please. The, the, the right blackboard I can read from here. Like this? Yeah. You wanted to. Uh, oh, yeah. So, does this formula uh, appear in some geometric DT theory too? Um, <laughs> there are a few other places where such a formula uh, appears. I have seen one or two references where, where this appears. This also appears in some setups as certain uh, Gopakuma Wafa invariants, which look similar. Um, I have, have to check these sources again. But yeah, I mean, expressions like this, such a Möbius inversion over binomial coefficients, appears somewhere here and there. And the universal source somehow is always dt invariance for the multiple loop curve. But this is really strange. Nobody really knows why this happens. Just a final time for a final picture. Is that okay? Which relates everything to. Um, scattering diagrams. So I just want to show you what happens for a quiver with two vertices. So final example, Q is the quiver with two vertices which are connected by M arrows. And there's a distinction whether M is one, two, or at least three. And we need a stability function. So the stability function uh, is the slope of d1, d2 uh, is defined as, well, d1 minus d2 by d1 plus d2. And then you can check that locally um, the Euler form is symmetric. And then um, I will show you a picture of the support of the dt invariance. So the set of all dimension vectors where the dt invariant is non-zero. Not the actual value, just where it is non-zero. And we have to make a distinction whether m equals 1, m equals 2, or m equals greater or equal 3. And for m equals 1, you have precisely 3 dt invariants appearing for dimension vectors 1, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 1, which is accidentally just the positive roots for an A2 root system. For m equals 2, you have two infinite series. And a special case here. Here the dt invariant is 2. Uh, the numerical dt invariant is 2, by the way. Um, so here it is always 1, and here it is the dt invariant is the virtual motive of P1. 
but you don't have the dt invariant for any multiples. So this is basically like an affine a1 tilde root system, or positive roots, where you have the real positive roots, and here's the imaginary root, but you don't take its multiples. And for m equals three, you have the lattice points of a certain, of a certain hyperbola, and then you have a region, a whole cone, which is completely dense. So all the dt invariants are non-zero, and they actually explode. The numerical dt invariants grow exponentially in this whole cone. And that's, uh, that corresponds to the hyperbolic rank two root systems somehow. Yeah? So that's an intricate relation to, to root systems. This has to do with, uh, with Katz's theory of quiver of indecomposable quiver representations. And uh, so these are lattice points of some hyperbola. And if you just uh, take the rays through all these points, then you recover certain scattering diagrams which appear in all sorts of chroma witten theory in the tropical vertex and uh, cluster theory and where else. Okay. Well, okay, that's enough for today. Thank you very much. Any question? Uh, general theory is also related to root systems. Um, yeah, but um, well, the, the connection to, to um, infinite root systems is weaker in general. It's definitely weaker. This rank two, this, this two vertex quiver is exceptional for that. Um, but I mean, there, there is still, there is still, okay. So, In general, so for general quiver Q, let me just remark that if the dt invariant is non-zero, then you require that the, uh, the quadratic form associated to the Euler form has a value less than or equal one. So you have a root for the corresponding infinite root system. But you don't have a converse. But not, uh, this condition is not sufficient to cover it. Not this. The reason why this is not sufficient is that you have to make this choice of, of stability. And, um, um, ah, okay, there is a partial converse, yes. Oh, this is, yes, okay, thanks for the question because I think this is actually not written anywhere. But there is a partial converse, namely, if um, dd is less than or equal to 1, and the D is a so-called Shurian root, and, uh, and if you make a sufficiently generic choice of the stability, so you avoid finitely many hyperplanes in stability space, then you can conclude that, um, that the DT invariant is non-zero. But is it true that if DT is not zero, then D is zero? Yes, if dt is non-zero, then d is definitely. No, but this is not now, uh, yeah, this is only for hyperbolic root systems. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes, even, even it's a root, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> okay. Why is it called uh, Donaldson Thomas in Bible? <laughs> um, Does it relate to gauge theory? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so we have to ask Maxim. <laughs> okay. Um, well, dt invariants are the mathematical precision for for B BPS state counts, and uh, there are string theorists who, to any uh, quiver, associate some kind of a, of a of a string theory for which you can do reasonable BPS state counts. But, no. <laughs> we, we have a question in the Q&A. Is it possible to decorate uh, a x cube by chain classes of bundles over uh, the, ah, uh, okay, the semi-stable locus R SST? Yeah. Cube. Okay, so yeah, on these moduli spaces of semi-stables, or in case stability and semi-stability coincide, you have tautological bundles, and you have some, you know, they have the churn classes of these tautological bundles. 
and you want to... Okay, uh, I don't know. So the general answer would be there are, of course, many, many possibilities of somehow decorating this whole theory by taking another base ring than R mod. So not working just with, uh, with this pretty coarse information of the motive of the variety, but working in some, well, bring some Grotendieck, bring some, some K-theory into the game using Schoen classes or uh, using classes of, of bundles or sheaves. Um, that's lots of things to do, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, okay, yeah, you could think about reasonable replacements for, for the space ring R mod, where you can do all this. Any further question? Yeah, uh, is there any relation with these DT invariants and the virtual motive of Hilbert, Hilbert scheme that you described last time? Yes, okay, so that's the, the DTPT story, which I, um, which I have briefly mentioned. Um, yes, okay. So what you can do is, huh. so you can figure it out as an easy exercise. I can also give you a reference, but uh, okay. So uh, we have this, we have factored this local series. We have factorized this as the X of one over L two minus one half minus L two one half, sum over all D, D, T, D uh, times T to the D. So that was our factorization. We also have a local analog of the thing I explained uh, yesterday of factorization one. Namely, you can define this logarithmic Q derivative This is this logarithmic Q derivative we have seen yesterday, but now we define it on the local level. And what we get is indeed a generating function of kind of local, local for the slope x Hilbert schemes of the quiver. Now combine these two. So plug in this factorization of the motivic gener local motivic generating series into the numerator and denominator here. And then you have a relation between the dt invariants and these uh, local Hilbert schemes. And this is, uh, this is where dtpt for quivers comes from. And this is great for computing these numerical dt invariants. That's the way you, you compute the numerical dt invariants. Because um, if you combine these two formulas, then you can directly specialize L to 1. But what is the PT side in this equation? I mean, the... Well, okay, this is... <laughs> no. Now, this terminology is very formal. Yeah? No, no, there is no explicit... Uh, no, there is no explicit PT side. Yeah. So I have a different question. So how computable are these DT invariants in for a general quiver, let's say? In is there a way to go from one quiver to another if they are somehow related? No. No. You have to do it really separately for, for every quiver. And I mean, everything uh, is like nested recursions. Yeah? Doubly or triply nested recursions starting from the motivic generating function, which is explicit, and a computer can easily do the calculations for you. But there's no way to, uh, to pass between different quivers because if you do some Easy operation just on the quiver, adding a vertex, adding an arrow, deleting an arrow, you completely change the representation theory of the quiver. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, Gabriel's theorem tells us that if the underlying graph of the quiver is an ADE Dinkin diagram, then we have no moduli at all, then the classification is discrete. But the underlying graph being ADE Dinkin, is absolutely not stable under any arrow insertion or deletion, oh, as stable under deletion, but not under insertion. You can easily take an, an ADA Dinkin diagram, add a single arrow, and it is completely out of the Dinkin or uh, affine uh, classification. Yeah. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, you can't do things inductively over the quiver. You have to do everything separately for, for any quiver. Unfortunately, let's postpone yes. uh, everything else for that. Uh, also, there was a question that I will show you later. Okay. We postpone it to the exercise session that will take place in an hour anyway. So let's Great. thank Marcus again. Thank you.